Hello and welcome to my tutorial here about setting up a metal deformation and glass breaking rigid body system here in Houdini. Pretty straightforward and easily using mostly the RBD tool set here in Houdini and then efficiently sending that over to Unreal so that we can see the result of that in real time. In particular, I'm going to be deforming a train from the side effects Project Titan thing, so go check that out. And for more general information about vertex animation textures and what they are, which basically is just a whole bunch of pixel offsets uh, per point on the geometry, uh, check out Simon's tutorial series on the side effects website. Uh, we will be talking about vertex animation textures, but you know, and I'm not going to repeat everything he said. I mostly just want to show you how to set up a sim, run it, bring it over, and so we have an actual like working example of that beginning to end. So without further ado, let's get started. You'll see I, I already made a new project called the Train Time, Train Time .hip. You can, if you're following along at home, you know, new project actually Train Time it. Um, I have this FBX file that represents the train already, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get started here by making a geometry node, calling it Asset. What I mean by asset is um, we're going to set up the idea of the train and how it simulates, the simulation rig, if you will, uh, which will basically mean that it is the actual rigid body components and the constraints that connect it together and also the final high-res geometry. We want to kind of encapsulate it all in one thing. So it'll be very helpful for us here because I plan on having two trains actually smash into each other, but we're only going to set it up once and then just move the two different assets around. You'll see what I mean. So follow along. So here we go. We have a file stop. I'm going to click on job. So it's in our little project, train time. Um, and that's going to be in this FBX folder. Again, I have it here already. And here it is. There's the train. So we can see the glass, the metal. And let's start with seeing are there any names in here there are some names we could take a look at what those are they may not be why is that there actually useful for us though so they all have some weird thing i do see that these are broken up by metal and glass which is helpful the names are not really there good idea to just give it some names it will assemble will do this for us pretty easily if we have create name attribute now if I were to look, you'll see we have different pieces. The pieces are numbered by the actual like continuous islands of geometry that there are. Because this isn't one piece. This is a bunch of different meshes kind of all clustered together. If I press, click on this, I go to set up to name, make sure it was. Click this. You can see it's broken up by color here. There's the different names. Now, instead of using that though, even though I just said all that stuff, let's use that shop material path. That's basically Houdini, old, ye old Houdini language for the material. So we've got glass and metal. Let's start with the metal. So I'm gonna click it in the viewport, type split, and we're gonna have that basically the metal coming out here and everything else coming out of the other one. Just so we don't forget that, I'm gonna put metal. And I'm going to put glass. Oops, started to type glass. So these are just nulls. You know, these are just, uh, you know, it's just they don't do anything. They're just for labels. They'll be convenient. Now, first thing we need to do is turn this into a bunch of rigid body pieces. As you can see, and this is often the case, it's not watertight geometry. Maybe some of it is, but a lot of this is just, you know, like this is just sliced open here on the end. We can see inside of it. There's not like, um, you know, this is infinitely thin materials here. We need to like give it some substance. And excuse me, I'm gonna probably move a little faster than I normally would in Applied Houdini lessons uh, for the sake of time. Um, so we got a poly extrude. What's poly extrude gonna do? You know, as I do this, you know, it's adding thickness to it. It'll be a little more apparent if I turn on output back. So if I look at it now, we went from, see how it actually has thickness? It has an inside and an outside to it, as opposed to before. Now, it's dark blue. Actually, I'm gonna make it even thicker, I think. Let's do double that. There we go. It's dark blue because it's actually inside out. 
the inside you can see is that the normal gray that we remember. We can reverse it, but it doesn't really matter because the very next step is, you know, we have all this like garbage. We have all this stuff intersecting everything else now. It's all like, it's this, it has the thickness I want, which I want to fracture this and turn this into rigid pieces. That's why we're giving it thickness because rigids can't just be based off of, you know, infinitely thin plates. Um, or I mean, I guess it can technically, but it's a, a little less predictable what's going to go on there. These are the solid pieces I want to break up into little pieces. All those little pieces, all those little rigids, we're going to constrain together. And the smaller they are, the closer it will be approaching a single atom of metal, you know, next to any other single atom of metal. We just want to have this broken up into lots of little pieces so that they can all move around and, and crumple, but the constraints will still kind of keep them together. You'll see what I mean in a minute. But so, right now, it's inside out. Let's do a VDB from polygons. VDBs are volumes. If I take a look at this, it has surface on by default, which is what I want. I'm not trying to make a, a fog. I want an actual sine distance function, which you know stores how close we are to the surface. Basically just a volumetric way of storing a, uh, you know, a solid object, which we have here now. So I'm gonna say 10 times as much resolution. Okay, well, that's pretty good. It's probably more than we need. Either way. So we've now basically taken this very messy geometry that's inside out and things are going through things and it's all just weird and crazy looking. Turn it into a volume and bring it back. So I'm gonna use a convert VDB here and turn it back into polygons. And now we just have this one solid clean mesh. I'm gonna turn adaptivity to, adaptivity to one with remove a lot of those like points along flat areas. So there we go. Fairly low resolution, clean, single solid mesh. Like I said, we want to break this up into a lot of different ridges though. So we're gonna do the oldest trick in the book, which is a Voronoi fracture. Voronoi fracture says take in some solid geometry also take in a whole bunch of points and break this up so that all the new resulting pieces are kind of centered around those points. So it actually takes a moment, although not too long, right? Yeah, there we go. We had these thousand points that were just scattered randomly on the surface. We now have essentially, uh, well, literally a thousand pieces. So if I go to exploded view, let's put this to the side here. Look at that, look at all those pieces we have now. Whoop, like that. These are the pieces that are gonna move around. If you wanted to do your own more custom thing, you could paint where the pieces go. Right now I just have a regular scatter, they're just kind of scattered everywhere. You can scatter by things like density. You could, you could paint on a density attribute using a attribute paint. Um, there you go. You could actually literally paint this, uh, set it to actually, I guess, density. You know, I, was I told myself I wasn't going to do it, but here I am doing it. Um, so now you can see if I were to scatter that based off of, there you go, you can see where I painted is where the points end up. And if you do that, your Voronoi fracture will actually be in terms of that instead. So that could be useful to cluster points where you are think that deformation is more likely to occur. As with our train here, and we know we're gonna smash it in the front. See that? Crazy. Uh, we could cluster more points in the front. So even though I set all that up though, I don't wanna do that. I just want to do regular old 1000 points everywhere. And that will be good enough for now. As we go, you could increase the total number of points, of course, which would give you smaller pieces, which would get you a, a higher res sim. Ultimately, you know, we can only, we're gonna deform the original high res metal later. So we're gonna add some resolution to it, but ultimately that's as much as it really can move around. Um, there we go. You know, it's as if you were gonna grab these points and move them. Um, Something like this. Let's say this is your deformation, right? 
you know, you can only deform as much as there actually is points to deform. So all I'm trying to say is no need to make a trillion points here if you're not going to have the actual resolution to capture it later when we actually track that high res to these sim pieces. Cool. So let that finish for the second or third time here. Let's also just call this metal and it'll, it'll make the names be in terms of that. So there you go. So it's metal one through, well, I guess it's more than a thousand pieces, but there you go. That can happen because you might have a, a point here and then it might make a piece on two different sides of a empty area. But at any rate, we have a, about a thousand pieces. They're all called metal something. And I know I already know I want to do this other thing, which is I intend on making all these things dynamic. I intend on making them all in a way that they will be able to be influenced by the simulation. So what I like to do sometimes for something like this is have a piece in the back here that's like an extra piece that I'm making myself. Meaning like, here's my box. I'll template this. This will just kind of represent the rest of the train. It's gonna represent stuff that's never gonna deform, but it's kind of propelling the other stuff forward and that those pieces are going to be attached to. So I'll just do a little fancy maneuver here. I'm gonna say, let's automatically move this over whatever the size that it is. So I want this whole thing to move, I want this right edge here to move to here and then the rest of it to go by. So basically that's the, that's the width of it in X. I want to move over that much. So I'm gonna say the incoming geometry, which is zero, move over by whatever the size is in X, like so. So now you can see it's just resting right next to it. I'm gonna give this a name. I'm gonna call this something just like the back of it. And we'll merge them together. And now, and you're gonna see I'm ignoring the constraints. You can actually use the constraints that it makes automatically. I'm, I'm not gonna bother. I'm gonna do something else. But at any rate, so there you go. We are, we're pretty much, we're on our way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this here and say, pieces. 